Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This piece was brought to you by Roberta's, robertaspizza.com. This week on Meet and 3, we're ringing in the start of our fifth season with dispatches from Portland, Oregon's biggest food festival, Feast Portland. We're bringing you words of wisdom on launching a food business from food blogs. Most acquaintances from high school have now tried to start a food or fashion blog in some sense and quit very quickly afterwards. To ice cream shops. Every city you go to, the salt and straw is completely different than any other city. We'll bring you insights and anecdotes about the business of the business. We were like, cool, we're going to do this. We're going to try to raise $75,000 and we'll see what happens. And it was like the most gut-wrenching, miserable month. Tune in to Meet and 3, HRN's weekly food news roundup, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello and welcome to Snack and Tunes. I'm one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. From 1972 until its closing in 1983, Todd Barkin's Keystone Corner in San Francisco was widely considered to be one of the world's top jazz venues. The club played host to a slew of live performances from such legends as Stan Getz, Sonny Rollins, Miles Davis, and Betty Carter. German-born chef Robert Wiemeyer landed in the D.C. area in the 1980s and over the last three decades has earned the reputation as one of the country's most respected chefs, opening some of the capital's top eateries, including the acclaimed Marcel's. In April 2019, these two powerhouses teamed up to revive the Keystone Corner in Baltimore. On today's episode, we talk about the history of the Keystone Corner, how these two met, and how the idea to open one of the most historic jazz venues in the country came to be. And from the archives, we keep things jazzy with the 2000 performance by Scott Kohlberg Trio. So sit back, relax, and here's another episode of Snacky Tunes. We talk about food, we talk about music, with musical dudes, finger on the pulse, Snacky Tunes.
Hello and welcome to Snappy Tunes. I'm one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. I'm here with Robert Weedmayer and Todd Barkin uh, of the Keystone Corner of Baltimore. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you for, for inviting us. So, Todd, we're going to start with you, um, uh, a legend, uh, a living legend, actually, uh, an NEA jazz master. But let's go back before that. How did you get your start into music, and what was the first band you saw that, that knew that you were on this faded path? Well, I mean, actually, I mean, I started playing piano as a, as a, a little toddler, and, uh, and my parents took me to hear Louis Armstrong, and that's when I started, really, when I was a little kid, and I heard Louis Armstrong and they had a lot of jazz records and Frank Sinatra records around the house, and I started kind of falling in love with the music, just as a natural, as a you know, a kid falling in love with something, and it was really excited me. And then I met a guy named Rossan Roland Kirk, this blind uh, genius who played three saxophones at once. I met him on the bus going to a baseball game, and he became a mentor to me. And so I started getting a real kind of sophisticated education in jazz almost by accident. And then I was uh, I went to Oberlin College and I was like a lot of kids I you know I went to the West Coast looking for, during the summer of love you know uh, I went to Oberlin College and I was still playing a lot of piano and and just I went there and I became a pianist in a Latin jazz band at night and a customs broker in the daytime and I went to a a nightclub to get a gig for our band. We worked a lot. We were a Latin jazz band playing Mongo Santa Maria music at that time in the 60s and, and early 70s. And I went to this club to get a gig. And then the guy says, well, I don't think jazz will work here because it's a beer bar, but I'm opening a big rock club across the bay. Why don't you get by this club and hire your own band? So uh, all of a sudden, and I said, oh, I only have $8,500. And to make a long story short, he took $5,000 down and 400 a month. And all of a sudden, at the age of 25, I was a club owner. So that was the beginning of Keystone Corner. And that was the beginning of my whole career. You know, here it is, you know, some 47 years later. And, and I'm still presenting jazz. And, and I'm working with a wonderful guy like Robert Weedmeyer. And, and we're... we're bringing some love to Baltimore. So that's, that's the kind of story. I mean, basically, I, just to finish just a little few more details, I, I finished, you know, I, I built the Keystone Corner into an internationally famous jazz club, kind of by the seat of my pants. And then I, uh, later on, I moved to New York and started working with Wynton Marsalis at Jazz Lincoln Center. I became a programming director there. And, uh, and then... Uh, I got the award as an NEA Jazz Master last year, in 2018, and that's how I met Robert, because he was hosting one of his flagship restaurants, it's called Marcel's, it's the number one uh, French restaurant in, in Washington, it's, it's an everything restaurant, it's one of the great restaurants of the world, and he was the host of our NEA Jazz Master's dinner, and we became fast friends there, and we decided, as our friendship uh, grew, that we would uh, work together on opening a great place for food and great music together, and that's how so, that's how this project in Baltimore developed. So let's let's go back to your 24. You're handed the keys to your club. Um, I know obviously your band played, but what were some of the early bookings that you did, and some of the the early the people in there, and how did you determine? Um, how are you going to get people? I mean, it wasn't like uh, that. You have the open accessibility today. How did you start to curate? The, the future legendary club? Well, I mean, actually, I inherited two nights with uh, Jerry Garcia and, and Merle Saunders. Uh, but the first two nights that we had the club, uh, um, they actually had canceled a bunch on Freddie Herrera, who was the owner of this club, who opened the bigger club in Berkeley. Uh, they had canceled a couple few times on Freddie, so they owed him a couple nights. And Freddie said, hey, Todd, I'll throw in a couple nights. You know, Jerry Garcia and Merle Saunders, they'll pack the, jo the joint for you, help you get off the ground. So Jerry and Merle came in and, and uh, played for me. And it was, of course, it was where people lined up around the block with no advertising whatsoever. So that was the beginning of the Keystone Corner. And then the earliest people that really lifted the place off its foundation, beside Jerry Garcia, who did the same, were like people like McCoy Tyner and and Rossan Roland Kirk, my childhood friend. I mean, uh, and and basically, I had met some people just being a musician, but a lot of it was just 
just sheer chutzpah, just sheer, you know, uh, you know, t- finding people and calling them up and, and calling a lot of artists direct and a few agents and a few managers and just building up a very quick network. I mean, but McCoy Tyner was really important. Rossan Roland Kirk, Freddie Hubbard, Ron Carter, and who opened the new Keystone Corner in Baltimore, they all organized a benefit concert for me, and that, I bought a liquor license. And that was Elvin Jones and uh, Max Roach. And that, that big, we did a big benefit concert at the uh, Paramount Theater in Oakland, and we raised uh, $85,000 for a liquor license. Then another childhood friend, uh, Grover Washington, uh, was another friend, and George Benson was another friend. They organized, helped me organize a benefit, and we built a kitchen, and we built and and uh, knocked a couple walls down and added more seats. So that was the, that was the real nucleus of the club. I mean, it was a labor of love, but it developed into a real cultural haven, you know. A, 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 and that's what we're doing in Baltimore too. We're building something that's important for the community as well as as a business. And a, a, this time. The major difference is that we have the wonderful added benefit of having a, a great a grand master in the food department, making it a, a, even a multi-dimensional cultural center. We have food that is is this, on the same phenomenal level as the music, and that that to me is a very very special part of what we're doing now. What you know, was the ex- when ex- you ex- what, what, when you knocked down that wall? What was the food that you were serving? Uh, falafel. Actually. <laughs> that was the food I was. That makes sense in the seventy two, seventy three. I mean, first with the first food when we knocked down when we built the kitchen, I had a soul food kitchen, I, yeah, and it, and it was a lady who was a really good soul food cook. But I very quickly learned that that uh, you know that, that I had to make a choice between being a full you know a full service restaurant and running a jazz club. It was a little tiny kitchen, and it was very, it was very difficult to run it with the kind of you know, you know, mass-produced food the way you would would need to do for 180 people. You know, it was a little tiny kitchen. So what I wound up doing was was subbing it out to a falafel restaurant down the street, and they, you know, we became a concession for them, and it was good for us and good for them, and it was great falafel and it was great hummus and. Everything was wonderful, and it was something that actually helped pay our rent, but it, we didn't go to any financial great risk. You know, Robert is, is, brings in a whole organization, the RW Restaurant Group, which is, you know, part of the organization of the, of the whole Keystone Corner of Baltimore. They, they are the, the anchor for the whole operation. So it's a, it's a partnership between the music and the food. Well, Chef, uh, you know, we, we always tend to find out on the show that most chefs' first love was, was music. And I know from your history that probably things a bit true. Um, what type of music did you grow up seeing, and, and how did you balance that with your early days of cooking? So my early days of music were, like, my, my music genre is really from, like, 19, like 1967 to, like, 1978. Um, you know, everything from Cosby, Stills, Nash & Young, to, you know, Buffalo Springfield, to, uh, you know, the Flying Burrito Brothers, um, to Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, you know, really rock and roll, the British rock and roll scene, um, the Dead, and so on. So I was really into music all my life growing up. I think the first concert, I know the first concert I saw one of the first concerts I saw when I was visiting from Europe, I saw Santana and Tower of Power in Oakland, at Oakland Coliseum when I was like, I don't know if I think I was like 15 years old. And uh, that was in 1975, I believe. But I just had That's this love for music. And like you said, a lot, of chef, a lot of chefs love or were really into music too. It's very true. Yeah, I, and I when did you start? Like, when did you get into the kitchen and, and start honing your skills? So I got into the kitchen at a very young age. My mother was an unbelievable cook, like most chefs. Um, you know, so I gravitated towards the kitchen, hanging out with my mother, going to the markets. Because I lived in Germany for 15 years, then in Belgium, 
uh, going to the markets with my mom, going to the fish market, the meat market, the flower market. You know, my mom knew, knew where to find the best blackberries, the best, you know, fish. And just cooking with my mother. And then I just carried on with it. And uh, I never looked back. I just, you know, I just started working in kitchens, and uh, that was it. I went to culinary school in the Netherlands and worked in Brussels. And they came over here first stint and came went back and came over here. I don't know if you read my bio, then I was at the Four Seasons for a long time and the Watergate Hotel. Then I opened up my own place in 1998, Marcel's on Pennsylvania Avenue, named after my first son, um, who's a, who is a bassist. He's a musician. That's one reason why I got into more of the jazz. My son was a straight-up jazz player, still is today. He lives in Nashville, and he plays in a couple bands. Well, he's only 20 years old. He's as old as the restaurant. He'll be 21. Amazing. And you also had a music venue in one of your other restaurants, too, or you tried to have music there, correct? Yeah, I still do. So I have Villain and Saint, uh, which I opened up four, year, four and a half years ago in Bethesda, Maryland. And it was strictly, I mean, when I opened that place up, it was all about just the musicians. It was all about original music and you know, one thing I found out about being a chef was, you know, when I would do these dinners around the, around the world, actually, with other chefs, we were kind of like a band. It's like, okay, you're doing first course, you're doing second course, you're doing third course, I'm doing fourth course, you're doing fifth, you're doing sixth. And we would pull up to a lot of these places, and there'd be nobody there to help us. It'd be like, you know, there's no one to help us carry our, our stuff in, no, one, no, no place for us to go hang out, no place for us to get a drink. And uh, then we'd have to clean up, and, you know, it was just a mess. So finally, you know, we, you know, we kind of bound together. as chef said, look, when we do these dinners, we want help. Um, so I found out after a while that musicians were kind of the same way. Oh, here, you want a burger? Okay, so you get a burger for doing the gig. Go stand in the corner over there. And, uh, you know, so when I opened up Villain and Saint, it was all about the musicians. It was about treating them right, helping them bring in their gear, having a green room, feeding them anything off the menu they wanted. Um, and, you know, that's how we started Villain and Saint. And I had a, you know, the Villain side was very, like, you know, I had pork shoulder, I had ribs, I had, you know, a burger. And the, and the Saint side was vegetarian. So we were moving along fine. But then I got, you know, I got wrapped up in other things and I lost a different manager and this happened and that happened. And, you know, slowly the place wasn't doing exactly what I wanted to do it anymore. It's still open. But uh, it's not, it's really, it, it could be a thousand times better. So um, set, set the scene before we get to the, the opening. Um, what, what, what was, because I know that you're already changing it and it's only been open for a few months. Like, what was the jazz scene in D.C. Um, pre-opening? Well, it, it, you know, that's one of the reasons that we wanted to do what we did to bring, like I said earlier, some love to Baltimore. There actually hadn't been a jazz club in Baltimore per se for over 30 years. And the last uh, place there was called uh, Ethel's Place, the name, uh, owned and, and operated by Ethel, the legendary Ethel Ennis, jazz singer from Baltimore. So they hadn't really had a jazz club um, and, and the jazz scene started there in a place called Pennsylvania Avenue in the 50s and 60s, and then the Left Bank Jazz Society became the real anchor, and that was a Sunday afternoon uh, jazz concert that was quite legendary in, in the jazz world, the Left Bank, and it was every Sunday afternoon, either 4 or 5 in the afternoon, and we have what's called a Left Bank set here at at. Uh, at at the uh, Keystone Corner of Baltimore, it's at 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And a lot of those people come to those sets. And and they have some of the most dedicated jazz fans in Baltimore. And this has been a, a real uh, breath of fresh air, like a beacon of light to, to these people who are very appreciative. There have been people that have come eight and nine times since we've been open. We've been, only been open. Uh, just over four months. About three months. Three months. Three months. Oh, it's just three months. April, yeah. Just three months and uh, just a little over three months we've been open and people have come eight, nine, and ten times. So uh, that it's just we're now in the process of building our base and, and 
we're going to broaden the musical palette a little bit and, and involve more, uh, you know, you know, some dead music, some dead music, some funk, some bossa nova. You know, we're going to broaden the palette. But right now, we, our, our opening was to reach out in a very solid way to to the straight ahead jazz audience and then broaden the audience from there. But there, there definitely have been a wonderful core audience to get this project off the ground. So, I mean, they, 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 they really appreciate that. Amazing. So we're going to take a quick musical break uh, uh, with a song from the archives, and then we'll be back here with Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network.
let's get into the club. Set, set the scene for me. It's obviously writ, uh, made for jazz fans, music lovers. What are the key components that you needed to make uh, an incredible room? Well, we, first of all, we had to, to build a, a, you know, a sound system that was worthy of the institution and of being a major concert venue. So we had to get a real sound sound system and uh built in we we put a carpet on the floor to to make the sound you know a little more evened out in the whole room we built a stage and a sound system when i first walked into the club my heart kind of sank because there's a very huge bar and i i walked in when i first came to look at it in uh, in early february i said uh, oh, where's the stage going to be? And I walked around the bar, but then I saw a, a major alcove. And uh, and that is where the stage is today. And it's a wonderful stage. It's, we, we we love our stage. And it's a big stage. It's a big stage. It's the biggest stage I've ever worked with in, in, a, in, a, in this type of venue. So it, we, it, it turned out to be a wonderful concert stage that we built there, a wonderful sound system and lights and everything. We had to build, make it a combination of a concert venue with great food. And, and, and so, I mean, it really is a jazz restaurant, you know. Uh, we are really selling sound. And, and so we have to pay great attention to that and really pay, pay close attention to that. And, and we're selling the sound as much as we are the food. The food, sound is food for the soul. So we're selling, you know, food for the stomach and food for the soul. So, so, Chef, when you're designing, when Chef, when you're designing this menu, what is your approach to it, and, and how does it maybe differ from when you're doing Marcel's or uh, your menu creation over the years? What, what goes into it, and, and what do you need to consider um, for the people who are coming to see the music, maybe first and eat second? So, so one of the things I found by because going to so many concerts and music venues my entire life that normally the food was really bad in most of these places you go to. Now in New York, you can find some, a, a good couple of places that do a really good job with the food. But prior to all that, I mean, I think that most of the places you saw with the food really was never that great. And so you would go there and you, you normally wouldn't even eat. Uh, so when I was thinking of, of, of Keystone Corner, you know, I was thinking, you know, 72, you know, when it first opened. I was, I was you know, Todd had turned me on to a lot of documentaries. Uh, you know, about Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and how strong the jazz community was up there, and there was the Crawford Grill. So I did a little, like, his, his, you know, history work on, uh, on the med, so I could come up with a menu that was very approachable to everybody. I didn't want it to be like Marcel's in any which way or form, where the majority of the menu is French. Um, I wanted it to be food that people go, oh, wow, that sounds really good. But when they got it, it wasn't just a regular old wedge salad. It was a piece of, you know, it's like a beautiful piece of artwork to look at, and, you know, and everything's made in-house. And, you know, the deviled eggs are like, you know, just gorgeous to look at, and they're just really, really tasty. But I wanted to be food that I would call Americana, like with a retro fit to it. So I've got a corn and crab best that I serve, you know, with, with popcorn on top of it. Um, you know, just little plays on things that you normally wouldn't see. But I, I didn't want it to be too fussy, but I just wanted it to be great execution of flavors that would appeal to a majority of people so that anybody, you know, would go into in there and go, wow, that's, I really want to eat this. I really have to have that. One of those menus you can't really make up your mind what you want to eat because it all sounds good and it's all familiar, familiarity. Um, I mean, things that pe people really like, they keep commenting on the, the – uh, Crawford Grill sold chicken, chicken. Then the Gulf shrimp and grits are popular, and the deviled eggs. Some people go nuts over yeah. the deviled eggs. You know, so it's just stuff that people are, you know know, you know that, and that, and then when they get it, they go, "Wow, this is different. This is really cool." Um, I've had a lot of comments because I'm there every day. I get a lot of comments about the the uh, the jumbo lump crab cake sandwich that it's the best uh crab cake sandwich that a lot of these people have ever tasted and that's saying a lot yeah in baltimore you got to have a great crab cake sandwich in maryland you do 100 percent. so todd yeah. when you're when you're relaunching uh iconic venue i mean no pressure of course but when you're curating <laughs> that, that that early lineup and you're thinking about you know what are you going to say 
you know, four decades later, what is the thought process behind it? You know, I, I know that you mentioned that you really wanted to make it for Dashville first in your time, but when you're reaching out to people, and I know that you're, you know, you could reach out to anyone, how are you building that and how are you positioning it um, to, the, to the people who are jazz fans and also for the people in D.C.? Well, I mean, I, I think we're just, we're just going for as high quality as we can. I mean, you know, I, I talked to Robert even before we opened, and I said, we have to, you know, make a statement, and, and I think we've been successful in doing that. I mean, it isn't something that you, you can do that analytically, but you kind of got to do it with your gut. I mean, in other words, just try to get the best musicians who are still here uh, who can recreate. And obviously, Ron Carter was a logical... Uh, opener because he was so integral in the, in the in the original Keystone, and he's still at the very apt, you know peak of his powers, and and the, probably the number one uh, ranking bass player, jazz bass player in the world. So he was a very logical and and a very fitting you know person to help get get the ball rolling there. But uh, the other people, I just you know a combination of what kind of uh, how exciting a performer they are. And then try, you know, I my concept of booking has always been a kind of architecture, like a sonic architecture. In other words, like we start, we opened up with Ron Carter for three nights, and then we had Kenny Garrett for three nights. So yeah, uh, Ron Carter has a more of a chamber jazz. Kenny Garrett's a more of a contemporary, you know. So you you have you have to have variation variations on the theme. So you. You try to have a real good contrast going on, so you don't have two weeks with just the same kind of programming. You have, you know, alternation, and then bring in a singer, and then bring in, you know, a, 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 another kind of uh, music. Yeah, the Duca da Fonseca, who's been a major part of my my uh, jazz life for the last several decades, even at Jazz and Lincoln Center, where I helped create Dizzy's and and develop that into one of the most successful jazz clubs in the world. But and he's kind of the inheritor of the tradition I had Ayrton Marrera in the original Keystone Corner. So there's always been a, a strong Brazilian component, and there's going to be more and more Brazilian music as part of uh, as, as part of this club. And it's been an underdeveloped element in, in Baltimore. So I feel very excited about that and very and heartened that there are things we can do it, you know, to build up, you know, build up appreciation for different aspects of this art form. And Eddie Palmieri, uh, Latin, jazz, Latin jazz. I mean, just being able to go from straight ahead, you know, from Eddie Palmieri to, to a straight ahead band. Eddie Palmieri is probably the king of Latin jazz at this point. And he just played for four nights for us, and he's coming back for two full weeks in December because it was such a – and he's going to go into all the schools in, in, in Baltimore and teach about Latin music in between two four-night engagements. And so it, it's 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 all about contrast and building up, you know, architecture. So I mean, it, it's hard to, to verbalize, you know, exactly how. But I I really it's like painting a picture. It's like it is exactly like painting a picture, like like the chef does when he when he organizes a menu or even a meal. How he sets up a plate, you know, you're 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 really setting a plate, and 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 you do that in music as well as as in food. I mean, and, and Chef, you know, jazz is so famous for variation. Do you see that once the menu gets established that you will begin to riff in the kitchen and, and maybe adapt to the performer or throw something special on there that, that matches and pairs with the, the music that's happening that night? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we will definitely be doing that type of stuff. I mean, when, you know, we've got a Latin jazz band in there, we'll be doing some Latin food. Uh, like when uh, Ron Carter played and he really liked Seafood Primavera. I made that for him. Um, you know, we're, we're there, we're there to, uh, to give an experience on all levels, on sound, feeling, you know, nurturing of your soul with food. Uh, so when you walk out of Keystone Corner, you get, you know, hopefully you walk out of going, that was unbelievable food, unbelievable music, unbelievable service. And I just feel like I just, you know, I can't wait to come back and do that experience again with some more friends. Yeah, but a lot of people talk about it as an experience, and that, that's, that's really encouraging to us because, you know, that's not how people talk usually when they, they go to hear an act in a, in a, in a quote-unquote a club. I mean, to say this, that was a wonderful experience. Right. And now we have, 
we have we've re not only revitalized the Keystone Corner legacy, but we've revitalized even the practice we had of right from the very beginning we had what are called Keystone cards, where you get and originally the Keystone card you, you won't believe this, but the Keystone card originally sold for twenty five dollars for ten shows. That's two dollars and fifty cents a show a punch. And now, you know, they're a hundred dollars for five shows or two hundred for ten shows. And and people are buying Keystone cards, and that's that's enheartening too because that's like a commitment to the whole experience. That that means you like. Yeah, that means you're, you're buying in. Yeah. You're buying into like being part of the the club or the or the, the restaurant club. Right. So I mean, and we're experiencing a very good reaction to, to that. So I mean, we're it's hard work, but it's it's well worth it, and it's it's very. It's very encouraging that how much the community really appreciates it. It's, it's, it. It makes all the difference in the world. And, and for Todd, for those who don't know, um, the honorific jazz master, what, what is it? How do you get it? What comes with it? Uh, and what type of class of jazz aficionado gets bestowed such an incredible title? Well, I mean, to me, it's, it's equivalent. Of, it's the highest award that our government gives in jazz. The, the roughest e- equivalent would be saying it's like a Nobel Prize for jazz. And what makes it particularly moving to receive it is it, is it, it mainly it comes from your peers. It comes from people like Ahmed Jamal and, and, and Eddie Palmieri and living jazz giants who, who are involved in voting on this uh, honor. And it's 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 accorded to uh, it's you know both instrumentalists, singers, uh, people who are um, you know significant advocates and presenters and producers of the music. So uh, all categories. When I was inducted into the uh, that Hall of Fame, into the NEHS Masters Hall, it was with Pat Metheny and with Diane Reeves and with Joanne Brackeen. So it was a wonderful class. That was my class in 2018. So it, it 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 you know it's a very it's a very small but uh, wonderful you know fraternity sorority you know brothers and sisters who are in that in that group so it's a, it's a really a wonderful honor only a few people a year get it and and Todd and Todd you're one of the few that have been nominated that's you know a, a promoter jazz club owner and promoter and producer right very few and and the other ones you know the the ones that have received it like Warren Keith News and George Avakian are, are you know my heroes right you know so I feel very moved to be one of the few people in that category who's received that award incredible it's, 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 uh, like like I tell my friends oh it's, I, I'm an overnight sensation in 56 years <laughs> <laughs> that by the way I can tell you that every chef and every musician can say the same thing unless for some reason they're 16 and they slam out. Um, right. Final final question to you. This is a collaborative question, um, as as would seem fit. Uh, what is the perfect night for you guys? Who's on stage? What are they eating? What are they drinking? Wow, wow. Well, for me, I'd be starting off with a bottle of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be having a bottle of uh, Bill Cart Simon Rosé, and I'd probably want to hear for me. I probably would love to hear the Duke of Devon Seca again play there. They were unbelievable. Um, and I'd probably be eating my, my uh, deviled eggs followed by my crab cake. Or, no, probably not my black bass, my fried black bass with uh, Brussels sprouts and, and the chili sauce. And I, I, I would have to have a, a, a sentimental, uh, you know, I'd, I would have a perfect night for me would be hearing a, an incredible set by um, like a gentleman we just mentioned, Eddie Palmieri, where the, it seems like the whole house is levitating. You know, that those are experiences for me, which are and it, it happened again with Gary Bartz playing this week at, at Keystone Corner. I felt like it was, I closed my eyes and it was 1972 when Gary Bartz actually did play the Keystone Corner and the music got by the. By the second night, by the second set on the second night, I closed my eyes, and it was 1972. And that's an incredible feeling because it was like Dexter Gordon was playing there or where the music, where you, you, you all of a sudden it has a timeless quality where you're listening every note, and you're not really conscious that you're, that, that you're in a club or you're, you're in a venue. It, the music kind of takes, takes, you away. To, takes you to another 
to another dimension in space and time. And that, that to me, and, and I'm, I've become a huge, I'm almost an addict to the, uh, you know, the scallops, the Robert scallops. <laughs> scallops yeah, I love the scallops. Uh, I mean, I, I loved a lot of aspects of the whole menu, but that's one of my absolute favorites. You know, I'm, I'm, really? the scallops are just uh, heavenly to me. So, uh, well, thank you both for, for joining. Where can people find you, find the listings, uh, get tickets? Where can they get all the information? Well, it's on uh, Keystone, www.keystonecornerbaltimore.com and instantseats.com. You, you can get, easily get our tickets for any show, any night. And uh, uh, we're, we're located in the Harbor East, wonderful Harbor East neighborhood of Baltimore, uh, by the marina, it's a very picturesque and wonderful and and, and uh, lovely area. Thirteen fifty Lancaster Street. Thirteen fifty Lancaster at the corner of Lancaster and South Eden Street, and in in, in the heart of Harbor East, right by the marina in in Baltimore, Maryland. And we've got the original, like the original sign from nineteen seventy two. Not the original one, but the same layout of the original sign from nineteen seventy two at his original club. Yeah, the original logo. Logo, yeah. And, and there's a sign that says "Music Spoken Here," and then a, a huge uh, reproduction of the original logo that was right out in front of Keystone Corner, right at uh, Powell and Stockton in, in North Beach in San Francisco. So the original logo is up, and and plus the sign that says "Music Spoken Here." Incredible. Well, thank you both. Uh, we have another song from the archives. And then we'll be back with the second part of Snack and Tune here on Heritage Radio Network. Thank you. 
My name is Brandon Boy, co-owner of Roberta's, a super duper awesome place. Roberta's is a very, 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 very proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. We're also super awesome. Thank you, Heritage. Nine dudes. Nine dudes in a shipping container. Uh, Matt, that's going to be uh, It's pretty diverse sounds, those two bands. That's like the headliner and the second headliner. Yeah, it's definitely an eclectic mix. Who, uh, who does the booking out here? Uh, out here, it's, uh, well, Chris Doritas is the curator, and we have uh, Nasir is the name of the fellow who actually books both L.A. and New York from New York. Really? Yeah, he kills it. He's very good. Every week for L.A., right? Every week, yeah. Four bands in both cities. I wow. mean, we book like, you know, 40 bands a year, and that's like... A struggle. A, not, well, hey. I, mean, <laughs> it's, I it's, make it look uh, like a it's, struggle. It's Sisyphus every year. Yeah. Right. But uh, that many bands. But I guess also, like, you're just, if you're like, I'm sure it gets people come at him all the time. Yeah, and, you know, we have the benefit of a, of a, you know, a lot of valuable relationships and, and work that Chris Doritos has put in over the years. And also... Um, it's a showcase that has gained some sort of awareness and notoriety, and so bands can come on and sort of become, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a stop on a career for some people. Um, what type of stop? The stop on the way up. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. One we the, play school night, and that's that's yeah, yeah. where it ends. <laughs> Hopefully, not the cul-de-sac of a career. But. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's great, and uh, you know, it, it's all what I love about school night is that it's all discovery. I also like checking out all the early bands too, because you're like generally those kind of are just sitting there creepers on their way. Yeah. Not even a stop. Maybe like uh, they're just rolling into town. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No stories. No stories. Just, just new. Yeah. Um, and you had Moses Sumney play on your show, who is now like on his way to whatever yeah. that is. He was is. incredible. Worth yeah. all of the buzz, worth everything. He was incredible. Yeah, he just did a, a piece for us as well. And it was just like, okay, like this is, this is something really special. But Matt is also in town, not just for this, but you're doing an event on Tuesday night for Fashion Week. Yeah, we're doing an event with Revolve Clothing. Um, it's a dinner, and as such, there is a food element involved that is of note. And our secret surprise guests are those food guys. Hey guys, welcome to Snacky Tune. We have Sushi Belly Tower here on Flat Snacky Tunes. We met out in LA in a lobby, and then I came to your dinner, which was awesome. That night. That night, it was uh, on like what was that thirteenth, fifth floor? Fifth floor rooftop. Yeah. Um, and the the guy, what he like owns, the, he runs all the elevators. It was so loud, and I was like, how does this happen? And Wait, 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 wait. What? He it's runs all... Elevator mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, elevator. Well, like, which, like, all the elevators in L.A.? Like, a lot of the contracts downtown, all the high-rises, like... Oh. Yeah. He runs, like, a lot of them, right? So, yeah, because... Huh. Because you're like, how is he getting... Because you guys had a loud... It was a five-piece, right? It was a five-piece horn. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is... Yeah. And, like, uh, well, if they complain, they, they'll never get back to their apartment. Exactly, they all turn the elevators off. Yeah, and all of L.A. They were complaining all night. Uh, were they? Yeah. Well, some people, there was two people in the building complaining, but I, I felt like there was a lot more love coming our way. I, I'm still bumping to people like, was that you guys doing that like live jazz? I was on my balcony like getting a, like a free live jazz show. Mike's, like, Mike's just standing back there. It's like, say something nice. Just in the shadow, <laughs> just like sitting in the corner of the elevator. Be nice to those boys. Uh, so why don't you uh, tell the people out here a little bit about yourselves and the... the the food organization that you participate in. That's a good way to put it. It's <laughs> it, it's it's kind of a, an idea that was born out of um, you know a new version of sushi, a new version of, of receiving like premium quality fish. Um, you know the Japanese in the classic format of Japanese sushi is always like with white rice and fairly high in the glycemic index. I know that sounds suddenly very technical, but I'll jump there because that was the inspiration. I was a, pro a former uh, runner, a uh, professional runner, ran at Stanford, ran the Olympic Games, and treated my diet really seriously. Mm -hmm. And so as I dove into like my favorite type of food, sushi, I was like, wow, how can I make this a little bit higher quality in terms of performing performance food? Because most performance food for runners is like pasta and carbo loading. And it was kind of like untrue in terms of its performance value. Sounds like my regimen. <laughs> <And so, laughs> it's my performance but, value. But, sure. Yes. <laughs> Wait, so I'm a runner, right? <laughs> oh, okay. It makes so much sense now. <laughs> so basically like farm to table vegetables and like the best, you know, quality like bites you can get. Um, and suddenly I was through a little party at my loft in downtown LA about 19, 20 months ago and a lot of people came and... Um, Participated and they told their friends, and now we're at you know we're out, we're approaching four thousand people in five cities and really having a great time pushing um, 
pushing this this sort of passion project that you know I have an awesome team and I just I couldn't be more grateful it's been really fun where did you pick up the knife skills well knife skills are a little bit like overrated in terms of their value I think I mean you, you could use the butt end of a knife as long as you have premium grade sushi I don't care if we mash it up and throw it on a spoon it's going to be a, a rad bite of, of fish like it doesn't really matter I mean at this point I've put enough hours in to like you know be okay at it but I'm no like Hanasubaki or whatever that means. I'm no like Japanese. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> For any of you who don't know who that is, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just here sort of like, oh yeah, that guy. They did the the band thing. Oh yeah, I've heard. Yeah, that. No, oh we yeah, agree. yeah, we <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. He's amazing. Yeah, but it's, I saw I saw him before he got big. It's yeah. ba- it's basically yeah. yeah yeah. Oh yeah, I mean maybe. Maybe. And my right hand man Eric has been holding down the fort and keeping. He's definitely the fire behind a lot of it. So you know, it, it's just a party that we would want to go to. Live music, the best food, put it on a rooftop, invite the coolest people around, <laughs> the and coolest, do it every yeah. night. Only the coolest people. Only the coolest. People. Only the coolest. They, we, don't, we don't decide. They decide. Uh, speaking of music, decide. you guys brought the Scott Kohlberg trio with you today. Uh, how did you guys meet up, or how did they? Come, how did you guys start working together? I actually met Scott. A few weeks ago, I walked out and he was lying on my couch at seven in the morning. Naturally, (laughs) he was uh, on tour on the West Coast, and then after chatting for a few days, uh, I was coming to New York to do these parties last month, and he had this band. I was like, "Do you guys want to play?" He was like, "Yeah, sure, sure." And I also needed a place to live, so I was like, "Can I live in your house?" He's like, "Yeah, sure." Um, Do you want been with us since? Yeah. Do you guys want to play us a tune? Yeah, we'll play a number. Yeah, you want to play us a number? Okay. What What's this called? Uh, This is a song of mine. called Banana Boat. Okay. Live on Snacky Tunes.
Rad. Really Sunday nice. jazz. Ooh. Sunday jazz. Some of that jazz coming at you. It's so nice. It's like the perfect uh, music for this type of weather with nine dudes in a shipping container. <laughs> uh, you know, just a casual. Um, so one of the things that's really amazing is we talk about the spaces and uh, the space that you guys for. Can you talk about the space for your Tuesday event? Or is it a secret? Um, no, it's not. Well, yeah, probably shouldn't talk. Wait, do, are people like, how does this aired? It's a five-story building in the middle of Soho with a pool with a window on it. It's an incredible space. Yeah, uh, my it's my it's my weekend house. So. Yeah, I mean, thank you for letting us. Borrow yeah, absolutely. It. I yeah. appreciate the break on the rental. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, only for you know ten percent off. What are friends for? Um, but I mean, it, you know, space comes to define your events almost as much as the food does. So, how do you guys find these locations? And you said that you were looking for a venue today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we we um. We never have like a, an absolute certainty about where we're going to do these. Um, that's just the nature of, of, of what we do. Um, so yeah, we f- I think we found a pretty cool spot mm-hmm. today. Can we talk about it? No. <laughs> I mean, what, when you say absolute certainty, are we talking like, oh, like a month out, we kind of looking to it, or we're like two days out? Uh, two hours out sometimes. I mean, I could never, I could never do that. I woke it up, 40 people come to dinner and lost the venue. I, and, and been like... Oh, we don't know what to do. I'm sitting at a coffee shop. Meet the person right next to me. She's like, "I'm having a dance party." I was like, "Sick." You want to also put together a dinner party with your dance party? She's like, "Okay." Turned yeah. out being a hundred person dinner dance party until like six in the morning. <laughs> it was awesome. So we get lucky. <laughs> no, just constantly on yeah. the ground, yeah. like yeah. raging. It's like, yay. What you don't say is that we asked fifty people before and they just told us yeah. to get the fuck out of here, get lost. <laughs> yeah, we have. I think we can say we can probably plug in Webster Hall. They've been really cool. Uh, you know, uh, what this is is people come to our dinners through word of mouth, and then they ask us how they can help. Usually, and um, lots of times it's a mutually beneficial exercise. You know, like Webster Hall wants us to kind of bring in some, you know, fifty or sixty interesting, coolest people in the world. You know, moment, and we just put up a. Um, you know, we went and saw it today. It looks really awesome, and we're going to probably do it there. Um, That's great. Where where in Webster? There's a bunch of spaces. Probably it just kept unfolding. Yeah, I yeah. Like, we, I have yeah. another one. I we think like, we're gonna do tent. like the secret back upper top yeah, floor room on room. the side, yeah. that little that, side room. That's what I think. It's a great room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've actually been doing like some events up there. It's awesome. And the live music. We think that yeah, you guys are gonna look great on that stage. Too. Yeah, that's like a really well lit stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll probably put ourselves right out in front of that. Um, but we're, we might do it um, elsewhere on another night. Um, just random spots, uh, office lofts, um, you know, industrial spaces. Like as long as we can make the room intimate enough with lighting, we we can work out in a, a cool dinner in a ten thousand square foot open space. As long as we can kind of like have a little sink to do some dishes and keep that flowing. And um, what's the? I mean, do you, is it propane like portable burners or is it mostly just like ceviche, sam, like sushi? No, no, this is like. So think of the be- think of Nobu without the rice and without like any Japanese isms. Just a bunch of jazz playing in the background. Right, um, jazz and sushi. Jazz and su- and it's mostly sashimi. So I, you know we consider ourselves more like food artists and social artists. We're not trained chefs. We just kind of know how to put together um, really well sourced ingredients. So, right. So ten, twelve course like we're talking yellowtail, bluefin tuna. I'm sourcing all my fish from non-Japanese sources too because of that whole scene. So you know the fukushima thing so there's a lot of like really awesome people i've met in that space you know to to put on dinner for a few thousand people over the past like couple of years we've gotten into really awesome sources of our fish so it's the best fish in new york there's no doubt about it at our party i can say that with absolute confidence shout out one of your sources if you if you feel free sharing um yeah that's a little tricky i i think uh, i'll say that a lot of it is local yeah, uh, local coast uh, line caught, bled on the um, you know, right on mm-hmm. the the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a dude, CP Lee, who's my man. I I could say that that that's his name. Um, he's he's awesome. So. <laughs> that's what I call him. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, that's his DJ name, CP <laughs> Lee. Um, we want to give a shout out to him. He's been really awesome. He he just really um, has been a blessing to get to know. And it took us a lot to get there. And we had to go out to Bronx in the middle of the night with. Yeah, we had no source when we first came for our first tour. Right. It was just him and I in a U-Haul van with all these plates and ev- our whole operation in the back. <laughs> we're like five in the morning. No, no it's two it's in the morning. We just yeah. finished a party. We're like flying over speed bumps. All the plates are flying in the air, like, trying to get to the fish market. 
it was definitely it was a Chevy totally Chase a, moment. Yeah, we were looking at each other, going, "What are what are we getting ourselves into?" And we had to pull into this massive, you know, new Fulton fish market and ask around for premium bluefin tuna, which wasn't even really available at that store. You know, it's just a different coast. You know, it's a different thing here. It's a little more fish and chips and right kind of kind of that side of of things and cooked fish and the way right. they manage fish is just different versus. You know the Japanese and have have a whole infrastructure on the West Coast from Seattle to San Francisco to LA. It's a little bit different um, out there. So it took us some time. We we were able to like just we went there every single night for ten straight days. And by the tenth day, they knew we weren't going away until we got <laughs> behind the guy behind the guy. Yeah. And, he, and now and he just kept unfolding too. Remember yeah. Bob? Yeah, Bob was awesome. Super old Bob. These all sound I, like, like I was a, names, like I was a boxer. <laughs> he was yeah. so cool, man. Just yeah. telling us stories. Of, like, Bob was forty years ago fighting underground, like. Whoa! Yeah, now yeah. he sells fish. Now yeah. he sells massive. He's been at the fish mart for I mean his whole life. Yeah, but he used to fight, and so we would go hang out just for like six hours. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, we come out of there and it's like light outside, and we go in at two in the morning. And it's. Um, why don't we get a uh, another song from the trio? What are you guys gonna play? Um, we're doing a lot of different things. That yeah. was the last song was a song of mine. This time we're gonna play uh, a Stephen Foster song. Great. Who's a, an old American composer. This is probably like composed in the 1850s or something. Um, called Genie with the Light Brown Hair. Sweet. that last vibraphone tone. You gotta tone it out. You gotta tone it out. <laughs> Matt, call it. 
I, uh, the last time I heard that song was Eugene Levy performing it in Waiting for Guffman. Am I right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well done. As man. part of his, uh, yeah, as part of his application for the for this. For I the totally play. forgot about that. The musical. Years in this uh, With, shipping container. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so it's, it's a diverse background from like a wide range of in, of influences. That song was written 1850. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Something. but it has been used like, I think I feel like I saw that in like a early like Warner Brothers cartoon, like a. Roger Rabbit type vibe. Yeah, it's just a, like American songbook, like traditional. Songbook. I wonder like what the requirements are to get into like the American <laughs> traditional. Like, does it? I mean, and could you get into it? I guess you couldn't get into it now. <laughs> to <laughs> have learned an instrument in the nineteenth century. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, if you just wrote a song in the eighteen fifties, you were in. Like the bar was super low, and then it just kind of got a little bit harder. Yeah, it was chopsticks, and then that song. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Um, are any of these events that you guys are doing tonight open to anybody listening, or how do people get to attend these events? Um, it's it's strictly word of mouth. I mean, I suppose, um, yes, they are available. Where there are seats, there's probably 10 or 12 seats available on mm-hmm. Valentine's Day. Um, we, we kind of are able to fluctuate. You know, if 30 people sign up, then we buy enough fish for 30 people. If right. 60 or 70 or 80 sign up, then we just kind of ramp up a little bit and make sure... Everyone has enough food to go around and make sure the venue can accommodate. But usually it's it, it's cool. But yeah, we have um we have some seats available. There's a, a little email um that people can respond to. It's sushi belly tower at gmail dot com and find out more information on on the events. That's um, so great. Uh, and then what other cities are you guys hitting up this year? Um, we've had all sorts of funny requests. We'll probably try to get across the ocean and, and hit London and do a bit of a European tour, maybe Spain and do some stuff over there. But and most immediately, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, back to San Francisco, where we always um, have great support. Um, Chicago. Chicago, definitely. There's a huge food scene Let it there. thaw out a little bit, though. Well, I think <laughs> that's one way of doing it. Like, we would enjoy it probably more if it was a little warmer, but I think they would probably enjoy it because we bring a little bit of, of right. heat to the table, <laughs> you know, right. a little different a little experience heat. right now. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, back to Miami. We're going to do some stuff down there as well. Um, and, of course, we're going to have, you know, New York is a staple for us. People in New York tend to get what we're all about, like, the second they walk in the room. Um, sometimes other other environments, other cities take a, take a little long, you know, just I don't know what it is about New York, um, but it's been all love since the first time we we, we threw a gig. Unless uh, you're going to the fish market, then it takes about ten days. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, we, they yeah we had to earn it. Yeah, they yeah. definitely don't 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 hand it to you. No, I mean, but you know, but once That's you why it, it tastes so good. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, yeah. This, you have to fight this city to exist in it. I think. Uh, I kind believe of. you can if you can make it here. Yeah. Something something. Yeah. It's up. No, it's a lot more <laughs> sprinting through the streets. Yeah. Than well, I mean, we're, we're all runners cities. here, based on our yeah. diets, right? Pizza's a runner's diet, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Was great. Um, all right. Well, if you go, how do people find you, follow you, get in, get a hold of you? So our our Instagram is Upstream Foods, um, just like it sounds. Um, swimming upstream to to get premium ingredients, um, and our hashtag is Sushi <laughs> Belly Tower. Um, and then again, and it's sushibellytower at gmail.com yeah. to reserve some seats or just hit us up and see what nights were available. Matt, how can people find you? Uh, big, big news everywhere on social across, media. Across, across all Across media. all platforms. All platforms. And don't forget if you uh, are around, school night starts in 30 minutes. Well, school night doors open in 30 minutes. The band start at 8. So. No, you need to get there at doors. What happens if it fills up and you uh, miss it? Yeah, we, we ask you to go over to Output. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> is that punishment? <laughs> no, I think it's actually much good. It's very cool. Um, and then, uh, Scott, how do people get a hold of you? Um, visit my website, scottcolberg.com, and there's a contact email. And uh, if you there. search uh, Reverb, I think, what was the website, the Everlung? You, uh, oh, it's it's hidden somewhere <laughs> on, the, on the internet. That's, just email Scott. He'll send it to you if you, if yeah. you want that. But the opening track, just to give credit where credit's due, is uh, Chad Lefkowitz Brown on saxophone and Joe Hurtenstein playing drums and Javi Santiago playing piano on that song. And here live with me in the studio is uh, Heim Peskoff on drums and um, Jean-Louis Trebu on vibraphones. And my name's Scott Colbert. I like to give credit where credit's due. Very classy. Yeah. Uh, and then don't forget we have our... Bar Food Blowout uh, on Tuesday night at Pork Soap. If you go to Snacky Tunes on Twitter, there's a link where you can buy tickets or you can just show up. Doors are at 7.30. We'll be there with Jeepney Maharlika. 
Radical Dads will be DJing. Yeah, it's going to be good. Love those guys. You can hear their show and all shows podcasted. Uh, just search Snacky Tunes on iTunes. And thanks to uh, Andrew and Aaron. Uh, Packed show. R- really big show. Really big show. Um, actually, it is the 50th anniversary of Beatlemania, so. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Yeah. I've heard of them. A- <laughs> almost as big as Moses Sumney. Not quite. <laughs> um, all right, Scott. Well, you guys want to. Uh, Let's take us out. Yeah, take us out. Sure thing. Uh, thanks for listening. What, we- what's the name of the last song of a jazz set? Is there is there, like the closer? The closing number. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. What was that? One more. One more piece of information. Yeah, just one more thing. If you guys want to hear Scott Kohlberg live, it's all, they're going to be playing at Sushi Belly Tower. That's right. Underground on Valentine's Day with a smooth jazz. Yeah. <laughs> coming at you live. Yeah, coming at Buy you your live. tickets now. Uh, well, thank you guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you. No, guys. we'll not. We'll be in LA next week. Yeah. But the following week. Yes, following week. All right, take us out, Scott. program is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.